Good day, students. This time, we will have quality control for our discussion. For our learning objectives, at the end of this lesson, you are all expected to identify the different variables involved in the total testing process. Next, differentiate QA or the quality assurance and QC or the quality control. Third, determine how to use the Westgard rules in identifying errors in quality control run and lastly, familiarize the steps in proficiency testing and determine its importance in maintaining quality in the laboratory. So before anything else, let's get acquainted first with this total testing process. So what is this total testing process? So the total testing process in the laboratory looks like this one. So it's a simplified and a cyclic framework. And as what you can notice, it has three phases. So you have the pre-analytic phase, you have the analytic phase, and the post-analytic phase. So the pre-analytical phase, as what you can observe, includes all the processes prior to the actual testing of a specimen. So before testing the specimen, the things that you do in the laboratory, including sample transport, sample receipt, your evaluation, and the compet competency of your personnel, and of course, the preparation of sample are all under the pre-analytical phase. But when we say analytical phase or the analytic phase, it consists of all the processes which are involved in the testing of the specimen. So, the post-analytical phase, on the other hand, includes all the processes involved after the analytic phase or after the test analysis. So monitoring the processes in all these three phases of testing is the key to ensuring patient safety and of course, reducing the possibility of medical errors related to laboratory testing. So these processes must be monitored from the time you receive the request from the doctor or from the patient up to the time you release the result because we need to maintain quality in the laboratory. So the pre-analytical phase of the total testing process includes variables associated with the entire steps, procedures, and considerations in handling a test request or what we call as the laboratory requisition form. So this request comes from the doctor and this includes demographic data of the patient and also the test being requested for by the doctor. So once the patient goes to the laboratory, the patient will give this request to the med tech. And of course, the med tech will inform the patient on the necessary things that he or she must do before the conduct of the test. So that is for the pre-analytical variables that we need to consider. So examples of this, we have test ordering and patient information. So we just have to make sure that all the data that we can see in the test requisition are correct. And if we notice, for example, ambiguous information, we just have to ask the patient to write those information in order to correct the information present in the requisition. And also, when you want to know the name of the patient, do not ask the patient questions answerable by yes or no. Always let the patient state his or her name just to make sure that you are asking the correct questions from your patients. Next one, patient preparation. This is very critical. Like for example, the abstinence or the fasting. Like when the patient is tested for FBS or lipid profile. So you have to explain to the patient the hours of fasting, the preparation, and of course, the food intake. Of the patient so you have to explain everything to the patient next one we have sample collection handling transport and of course storage so this also includes proper techniques in phlebotomy the tubes that you will be using for the test proper mixing of the tube containing the specimen and also the correct anticoagulant that you will be using and the temperature of handling and when or where to store the specimen next one we have Processing of specimens, centrifugation, and separation of specimen. Like for example, when you separate the cells from the plasma or the serum, so you just have to make sure you avoid hemolysis. And also, the 
pipetting techniques for example so that is also included in the pre-analytical variables however these variables are difficult to monitor and control because most occur outside of the laboratory so like the transport and the handling of the specimen so that's for your pre-analytical variables how about for your analytical variables for analytical variables it concerns the laboratory personnel equipment reagents quality controls verification and sometimes interpretation and diagnosis so this is now the moment you process the specimen and you run quality control materials but take note of the word here sometimes interpretation and diagnosis are included take note this is included in the post analytical variables so why is it included now in the analytical variables because sometimes by just looking at the specimen during analysis we already have an idea on the possible result of the test of the patient like for example uh, we see a chylus or milky specimen so it would tell us that the specimen of the patient contains a high cholesterol or triglyceride level for example or for example we see an icteric specimen that could indicate a high bilirubin concentration so that's why interpretation and diagnosis are sometimes included in the analytical phase so these analytical variables primarily depend on instrumentation and of course the reagents that we are using and of course the way we conduct our daily and monthly preventive maintenance so this includes also the specimen analysis and the commercial controls that we are using how about the post analytical phase so this is now the final phase of the total testing process and involves evaluation of lab test results so take note if your pre-analytical phase includes the evaluation of a test request your post analytical phase includes now the evaluation of a test result so the variables included here are reporting out specimen results so like when a med tech sign the result countersigned by the pathologist and give it to the patient to the nurse or to the attending physician next one physician contact or when you relay the result to the doctors or even to the nurse in charge for example next one we have reference ranges like when the doctor interprets the result of the patient so these are all included in the post analytical phase so this is very important because releasing of test result in a timely manner to appropriate individuals especially if you have critical result then th that is very necessary to support clinical decision making because when you lost a report when you delay the reporting of the result then that could jeopardize the patient um, condition or that could jeopardize the diagnosis of the patient however the main advantage of technology now is that the errors in this post analytical phase have greatly decreased because of automation and of course computer generated patient reports so those are for your total testing process let's have now the definition of quality control so it is a statistical process that is used to monitor and evaluate the analytical process that produces patient's result so take note it focuses mainly on the analytical phase so this is a systematic monitoring of the analytical process in order to detect analytical errors that occur during specimen analysis and the main purpose of that one is of course to prevent the reporting of inaccurate or incorrect patient test results so that's for your QC so for the requirements we have here there should be a regular testing of quality control products along with patient sample and of course you have to compare QC results to specific statistical limits or ranges so in short the QC results are used to validate whether our instrument is operating within predefined specifications so that could infer that the patient test results are reliable and once the test system is validated the patient's results can then be used for diagnosis prognosis and of course treatment or planning for the treatment of the patient 
let's differentiate quality control and quality assurance. So based on the illustration, we can now see that QC is part of quality assurance. And remember earlier that your QC focuses on the analytical phase. So that means because QA is larger, this now includes the total testing process from the pre-analytical phase to the analytical phase up to the post-analytical phase. And because of this one, we can say that your QA is process-oriented from the time you, you get the requisition coming from the doctor or the patient up to the time you release the result. That's part of the QA. Whereas your QC, it's product-oriented. So that means you are ensuring that you are conducting the test correctly so that you can create a good product or a good test result. That's part of your QC. And what's the goal of QA and QC? To ensure the reliability of results. So that means the results have precision and accuracy. And also, this is a requirement for the renewal of license to operate a clinical laboratory and even a blood bank. So let's differentiate your QA and QC further. So your quality assurance again is process-oriented and your quality control is product-oriented. So that means your quality assurance makes sure you are doing the right things the right way. Whereas your quality control makes sure that the results of what you've done are what you expected. Next one, you plan to avoid the defect in the first place for QA. Whereas for QC, you try to find defects and correct them while making the product or like when you conduct the test. Next one, QA is all about prevention. Whereas QC is all about detection, detection of error. Next one, QA involves processes managing quality, whereas your QC is used to verify the quality of the product. So that's the difference of your QA and your QC. Now we have the quality control product. So first, what is a control? So a control is a substance or a solution that contains an established amount of the analyte being tested. That's why it has a known concentration of the analytes. And also, it's a patient-like material because it is ideally made from human serum, urine, or even spinal fluid and other body fluids. And it could be liquid or lyophilized. So again, when we say it's lyophilized, it is freeze-dried or dehydrated into powder. That's why it requires reconstitution. You have to add distilled water to it. You just have to mix it carefully. To avoid incorrect control values. Another thing, it should be tested in the same manner as the patient's sample because before you test a patient's specimen, you have first to run a control. That's why a control is tested at the same time and in the same way as patient's sample. And again, the purpose of this quality control product is to validate the reliability of the test system and of course, to evaluate our performance in the analytical phase that, of course, might impact our result. And next one, we have the two types of controls. You have normal and abnormal control. So for abnormal control, you have abnormally high control and abnormally low control. Normal control means it contains normal levels of the analyte being tested. Whereas abnormal control contains analyte at a concentration above or below the normal range for the analyte. And a good laboratory practice, you have to remember, requires testing normal and abnormal controls for each test at least daily to monitor the analytical process. But some of the laboratory would test control per shift. For the different types of control solutions, we have the pooled serum and commercial control. So the term pool here or pooled comes from the idea that the serum specimens were obtained from different individuals and then they are mixed together, creating one control solution. So this pooled serum can be coming from human or coming from animal sources. So human sources, it's more expensive but preferred. Because again, it resembles patient sample because it comes from 
human patients. For the animal, the most common animal source is the bovine serum or the serum of the cow or other cattle. Next one, for the commercial control, they are already prepared by the manufacturer and usually they are lyophilized. And again, they are more stable. And because they are lyophilized, they require reconstitution. So you add distilled water to it. And remember again, incorrect mixing results to incorrect control values. And for the two types of commercial control, we have the acid and an acid. For the acid, it's more expensive because the company which created the control already established the reference ranges of these control values. And normally, it is set at 2 SD. For the anacid, this is cheaper because the control is lyophilized, you need to reconstitute it, and it's the laboratory that will get the reference range for that particular control solution. So this table shows an example of a QC log with patient results for potassium. And we have two ranges of controls reported here, level 1 for the normal control and level 2 for the abnormal control. And for the expected ranges or acceptable ranges, we have 3.7 to 4.3 millimoles per liter for level 1 and 6.7 to 7.3 for level 2. So what happened here is that when the daily QC result obtained for the normal control is compared to the range calculated for that normal control, it becomes apparent here that each result lies somewhere within the expected range. So this indicates that the analytical process is in control at the normal level on that day of testing. And then, when the daily QC result for the abnormal control for the high potassium is compared to the defined range for that abnormal control, the analytic process is shown to be in control for each day of testing except for the last day on November 7. So as what you can observe here, from November 1 to November 6, all the control values fall on their expected ranges. So that means the patient results could be reliably reported. However, the laboratory was out of control for abnormal high potassium on November 7 because the value obtained for the QC material is 8 millimoles per liter, which is outside the expected range. So what are you going to do? What does it mean? So this means that some error occurred which may have made the patient's results unreliable. So you should not report any patient's samples with an abnormally high potassium result until the error is resolved and the abnormally high samples are retested. So this scenario is very common because a test system can malfunction or let's say begin to malfunction at any time since the last successful quality control. So in this example, it would be a good laboratory practice to retest all patient samples that were reported with abnormally high potassium levels or near the upper limit of normal since the last QC was performed. We can also retest a random sample of patients versus all the sample that we are testing here. It is acceptable, although it is a risky practice. Just like in this case, we are dealing here with potassium and the amount of time the plasma or serum has been in contact with cellular elements must be taken into considerations. So you can randomly select a sample, but you also have to consider the requirements for your specimen and the analyte that you are testing. So that's how you deal with quality control in the laboratory. Now we have the tools needed to achieve accuracy in our testing. So first we have this standard or standard solution. So a standard is a 100% pure substance that contains a specified concentration of that parameter. And it is accurately weighed and prepared and certified by professional organizations. 
So what I want you to remember here is that this standard is used as a reference for the unknown. So the unknown is our patient's sample. So before you run or you test a patient's sample, you have first to check your standard value, especially if you are doing it manually or you are conducting the test manually using, for example, a spectrophotometer. So you have to test a standard first before you test your patient's sample because, again, your standard is a reference for your sample or for your unknown. So when a standard is used in place of a sample and then tested, the result should match the concentration of the standard. So you should have a matching result because that will give you a confidence that the test is working correctly. But if there is any discrepancy, like for example, the discrepancy is greater than 10%, then that could indicate a problem that must be investigated. So that is for your standard. Aside from your standard solution, we also use your blank solution in order to achieve accuracy in our testing. So this blank solution is used in order to cancel out or zero the absorbance of all the other components in the sample except the component whose absorbance is to be measured. So in short, your blank solution contains everything that is in your sample except that one material that you are measuring. And the definition given here is also related to the use of our spectrophotometer because before using the spectrophotometer, it is very important to set the absorbance reading at zero to eliminate any contamination, any artificial sources of error to be introduced to your spectrophotometer. And another thing, your blank solution contains very little amount of analyte of interest or sometimes it does not even contain any detectable amount of the analyte of interest. And the main purpose of this is usually it is used to calibrate our instrument, our spectrophotometer for example. It's like analogous to zeroing a scale before weighing. So you need to zero it out first. And we have three types of blanks. So we have the water blank, which is used if the reagents are colorless. We have also the sample blank, which can correct for potential error from existing color or turbidity in the sample before the agents are added. So this means we are using this one if our sample is having color or turbidity, like when we are having icteric or chylo samples. Next one for the reagent blank, it can correct for the absorbance caused by the color of the reagents. So that means this reagent blank is used if our reagents are colored. And the absorbance of reagents is automatically subtracted from each unknown reading. So that is for your blank solution. Now let's have the Levy-Jennings chart and Westgard rules. So I hope you still remember our previous lesson on the principles of measurements wherein we have computed for the mean value, the standard deviation, the CV, and wherein we set the confidence limit on a Gaussian curve because all those data are needed for us to analyze this Levy-Jennings chart. You can also check out the link under this video so that you can have a review on that topic. So first, what is a Levy-Jennings chart? It is otherwise known as a Schuhart plot and it's considered as the most common intralaboratory quality control chart and it is described as a Gaussian curve on its side. So this is your Gaussian curve, the normal distribution curve on the side. And this area, this is where we plot the control values. So this is our Levy-Jennings plot. So we use this to graph successive quality control values day-to-day -day or depending on the protocol of our laboratory. And I have here an example of a Levy-Jennings chart containing control values for cholesterol. So how do we make this Levy-Jennings chart? So in order to prepare this, we need to have at least 20 control values. And then we will calculate the mean and the standard deviation. 
and we can now set the confidence limit and usually it is at 2SD. And another thing, if you have already all those data, you can plot now the control values on the y-axis against the day or time on the x-axis. So that's how you use your Levy-Jennings plot. So this is also an illustration showing your Levy-Jennings plot. At the center, you have here the mean. You have here the SD, the first SD, the second SD, and the third SD. So we need this data in order for us to analyze everything in your Levy-Jennings chart. So this time, I'm going to teach you on how to plot the control values in a Levy-Jennings chart. So I hope you still remember these values from our previous lesson, the principles of measurements. So we have here our first SD, 17.9 to 18.1. Next one, we have two SD, 17.7 to 18.3. And our third SD, 17.6 to 18.4. And we have here the mean at the center. So for our first SD, we have here the negative 1 SD, that is 17.9. And you have the positive 1 SD on top, that is 18.1. We also have the negative 2 SD, which is 17.7 up to 18.1. So this is our positive 2 SD. Next one, for the third SD, we have here 17.6. And then we have here the positive 3 SD, 18.4. So how do we plot the control values that we obtain? So day 1, we have obtained a control value of 18. So this is the day 1. So that is your control value that you have obtained. For day 2, we have 18.1. So we have here 18.1. For day 3, we have 18.2. So it's around the center of 18.1 and 3. So we plot it here. And on day 4, we have 17.9. So we have day 4, 17.9. Day 5, we have again 18. And day 6, we have 17.8. So we have here 17.8. Next one, day 7, 18.1. So we'll have it here. Day 8, we have again 18. Day 9, we have 18.2. And lastly, for day 10, we have 17.9. So we have to plot the values and connect them. So after doing that, we can now analyze these control values using our rejection criteria. That's our Westgard rules. So that's how you're going to plot that value. I only gave you 10 examples so that it will not be a lengthy discussion. So how do you find the technique in plotting the control values in the Levy-Jennings chart? Because that method has also its own drawbacks. So number one, it's cumbersome. And after the data are obtained, the individual points are plotted on graph and analyzed visually. So what if you will not be only dealing with 10 control values? What if you will be analyzing the control values for the entire month and the succeeding months? So it will be very time-consuming and subjective because the interpretation will be based on the medical technologist analyzing the Levy-Jennings chart. That is why the Westgard rules are developed to improve quality monitoring and, of course, decrease subjectivity in data analysis. So, this will help us in our troubleshooting. So, for convenience, we adopt a shorthand notation to abbreviate different decision criteria or control rules. So, for example, in 1-2-S, this indicates one control measurement exceeding the 2S control limits. But other papers may use somewhat different notation, just like this one, 1, 2S, or for example, 2, 2S. So you can use that interchangeably. And other rules we have here. So these rules, again, will help us test or determine if our analysis is in control or out of control based on the values that we have plotted in our Levy-Jennings chart. The first rule that we have here is the 1-2-S rule. So this means 
one control value outside either of the positive 2SD or outside the negative 2SD. So this is our warning rule which tells us that a random or systematic error may be present in the test system and the relationship between this value and other control results within the current and previous analytical runs must also be examined. So if no relationship can be found and no source of error can be identified, we can assume that a single control value outside the positive or negative 2S limits is an acceptable random error. So it's acceptable, meaning to say we can report the patient results. Next, we have the 1-3S rule. So this means one control value is outside of the positive 3SD or negative 3SD. So you might see it here, outside of the positive 3SD or outside of the negative 3SD. So this rule identifies unacceptable random error or possibly the beginning of a large systematic error. And any QC result outside this positive or negative 3S violates this rule. Next one, we have 2-2S rule. So this means two consecutive, take note of that one, two consecutive control values exceeded the same limit either the positive 2SD or the negative 2SD, just like what you can see here. Or it might also be outside the 2SD as long as it is consecutive. So that is for your 2-2S rule. Next one, we have the R4S rule. So this means one of the control values is outside of the positive 2SD and the other one is outside of the negative 2SD. And they are also consecutive values. Next, we have the 4-1S rule. So this simply means four consecutive control values that exceeded either the positive 1SD or the negative 1SD. So in this example, we have here four consecutive values that lie outside of the negative 1SD. So they are all in the same side of the mean. Next one, we have the 10x rule. So this simply means 10 consecutive control values that lie on the same side of the mean. So in short, they are here on the positive side or on the negative side as long they are all on the same side of the mean. Next one, we have the 8x rule. So sometimes we see this as a modification of the 10x rule to make it fit more easily with n's of 4. So when I say n, this means the total number of control measurements that are available at the time a decision on control status is to be made. Like for example, if n is equal to 2, then that means we have two measurements on one control material or it could be one measurement on each of the two different control materials. And when I say, for example, the N is 3, that could mean um, it involved one measurement on each of the three different control materials. And lastly, if the N is 4, it could mean two measurements on each two different control materials or four measurements on one material or it could also be one measurement on each of four materials that's your n the total number of control measurements so for the 8x rule this means eight consecutive control measurements on one side of the mean next the 12x rule so this means 12 consecutive control measurements on one side of the mean so the 8x and the 12x are usually used with ends of 2 or 4, which means they are appropriate when two different control materials are measured one or two times per material. So that's for your 8x and 12x. Next, we have the 2 of 3 2s rule. So this means two out of the three control measurements exceed the same mean plus the 2s or mean minus the 2s control limit. Next one, we have the 3-1-S rule. So this means three consecutive control measurements exceed the same mean plus 1-S or mean 
minus 1s control limit. And then next one, we have the 6x rule. So this means 6 consecutive control measurements that fall on one side of the mean. Next one, the 9x rule. So sometimes we will see also modification of the 10x rule to indicate a larger number of control measurements that still fit with an N of 3. So that is for your 9x. And for the last one, we have the 7t rule. So this means 7 control measurements trend in the same direction, like they get progressively higher or progressively lower. So that is for your 7T rule. So those are the West Guard rules that we can commonly encounter, but oftentimes we only have the six rules, the 1-2S, 2-2S, 4-1S, 1-3S, R-4S, and 10X. So the rest are just some modifications of the first six rules, especially of the 10X rule. Let us analyze this Levy-Jennings chart. So the midline contains your mean, so this is 252.3 and also the SD values are reflected in here. So first we have a 2 to S violation. So that is 2 to S because two consecutive control values lie outside of the positive 2 SD. It could also be two consecutive control values outside of the negative 2 SD. But in this case, it's outside of the positive 2 SD. Another one, we have the R4S violation because one of the control values is outside of the positive 2SD and another one is outside of the negative 2SD. So that is your R4S violation. And also we can find 10X here. 10 consecutive control values on one side of the mean. And also this could be a 10X violation. That's also 10 consecutive values that lie on one side of the mean. So in short, this Levy-Jennings chart reflect our analysis that is out of control. So that is how you're going to analyze the data using the Westgard rule and of course the values plotted on your Levy-Jennings chart. We also have the multi-rule QC that uses a combination of decision criteria or control rules to decide whether an analytical run is in control or out of control. So just remember this one. As what I have told you earlier, this is your warning rule. So if you see any violation of this rule, that means you have to look carefully before proceeding with your analysis. So if you have this control rule violation, the next time around, you see other control rule violations. That means you have to stop or reject your run because you are already out of control and you should not report the patient's result. But if you only have 1-2-S violation and nothing else, then you can proceed and you can say that the run is in control. And also, you have to remember that the N must be at least 2 to satisfy the US CLIA QC requirements. Next, we have the two types of errors, the random and the systematic errors. So we have also for the systematic, it could present as a trend or a shift in your data analysis. First, we have the random error. There is no trend or means of predicting it, and it only occurs once. That's why it's a non-repeating error. It's easy to spot, and usually it is a human error. Examples of that, you have 1-2-S, 1-3-S, and R-4-S violation. Also, we have this mislabeling of sample, improper mixing of sample and reagent, voltage fluctuations, and temperature fluctuations. So to assess the situation, to know if there is really a random error occurring, the sample is reassayed using the same reagents. And if a random error occurred, the same mistake may not be made again. And the result will be within appropriate control limits. Unlike your random error, your systematic error is a repeating type of error. That's why you can see trend in your data. So examples, 2-2-S, 4-1-S, and 10-X rule violations. So in short, all the West Guard rules that indicate trends identify systematic errors. And other causes include improper calibration, deterioration of reagents, sample instability, instrument drift, and changes in standard materials. And also, unlike your random error, 
when you re-assay this type of error, you will not correct the problem instantly. That's why you need to further analyze the data. So how are you going to initially resolve this one? So you can prepare new control materials or new reagents. You can re-standardize the assay. Or you can check the wavelength and instrument settings, for example, of your machine. And also, the reagents that are close to expiration date should be discarded. So that's how we are going to deal with systematic errors. So your systematic error can present as either shift or trend. So when we say shift, there are six or more values on one side of the mean and they maintain a constant level. And usually, this indicates deterioration of standard. For the trend, we can see control values that increase or decrease over a period of six consecutive days. And usually, they pass through the mean. And this one usually indicates deterioration of reagents. So just like in this case, we can see six or more consecutive values that fall on one side of the mean. So what type of systematic error is this one? This is a shift. And actually, this is a 10x rule violation. Next one, we have here control values that continue to increase or decrease and usually they pass through the mean. So this one is a trend. Let's talk about proficiency testing. So this is also known as interlaboratory comparison because as the term implies, proficiency testing compares the measuring results obtained by different laboratories. Because what is happening in the proficiency testing is that some of the laboratories participate in the accreditation and now what will happen is the accrediting agency will send unknown samples to these participating laboratories and they will also provide them with proper instructions on how to reconstitute, for example, or on what assays to be performed on the unknown samples. So once the laboratory receives these samples, they will analyze it the way they do it routinely in their laboratory. And after the analysis are carried out, the results are mailed back to the accrediting agencies for comparison with those from other laboratories involved in the program. And then, the data are returned to the laboratory with comments and recommendations. So in short, proficiency testing determines the performance of individual laboratories for specific tests and usually it is used to monitor the continuing performance of the laboratory. So that ends my discussion. Thank you so much.